Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Lawmakers in the Indian state of Assam have recently passed a ban on what they consider to be unscientific methods of healing and magic. This includes prayer for healing, which could lead to arrest for those who practice it. Some Christians are concerned that this law is specifically targeting them. It's an attempt to restrict their religious practices and evangelism efforts. Well, joining us with more on Christian persecution in India is president of the Human Rights Education Relief Organization, Jason Jones. Jason, at least two Christians suffer persecution every day in India. So why is that? And what do you think of this latest proposed law in Assam state? Well, what we're seeing in India now is, is a war against Christians, especially the Northeast, the hill people. Um, the Kuki tribes in their community, there's not a single church left. In the past year, over 200 churches were burned down. Hundreds of people were killed. Recently, a violent mob of Hindu extremists brutally beat and raped uh, over 20 women and then paraded them through the city naked. So when you're seeing hundreds of churches burned, 70,000 Christians displaced in India. And, you know, you have to set that in a world that's on fire. You know, we have in the Philippines now ISIS blowing up churches. In Nigeria, nine out of 10 martyrs, um, Christian martyrs in the world this year will be in Nigeria. Communist Party of China continues to disappear uh, Christian evangelists and Catholic bishops uh, monthly. And it's kind of shocking to a lot of Christians to discover that we often think of Hinduism as a peaceful religion. And when I try to talk to people about the rise of Hindu nationalism and the Hindu extremism in India, people will often giggle and say namaste. But the reality is extremists have been emboldened uh, by this ethno-nationalism. They have this ideology, this extremist ideology um, that says that to be Hindu is to be Indian, to be Indian is to be Hindu. And so they don't even recognize um, these communities. And a lot of Christians are, are surprised, Gary, to discover that there was a, there are Christian communities in India that have been there since the first century. St. Thomas himself established those communities. So India has a long, rich history um, with Christians as an integral part of that history. And so it's quite frightening to see the rise of extremism, but these laws that are being passed, the brutality to the Kuki uh, uh, tribes, people who are 90% Christian, um, I see as a canary in the coal mine for the rest of India. Well, what do we do about it? I mean, Modi, uh, Prime Minister Modi has done nothing to stop this. No, and he's coddled by Western elites, even Christians. You know, Pope Francis hugged Modi. You know, it's it's quite sorrowful. We saw the silence of the Western church when the first century Christians in Iraq were being annihilated during ISIS. By ISIS in October, we saw the ancient Christian community, the Armenian Christian, Christian community of Artsakh completely ethnically cleansed and not a word from the Western church. There's no doubt that in the United States today, we wrestle with our own struggles and persecution, but we have to really understand that we are still the, the freest, most privileged Christians on earth, and as Christians, as members of the body of Christ, 
if we are not the voice for the kooky Christian tribes people, if we are not the voice for the Christians rotting away in uh, black prison sites in the CCP, if we're not the voice uh, for the persecuted church in Nigeria, they will, they will have no voice. We cannot count on the New York Times. Uh, it's going to be each and every one of us in our churches asking our, our, our communities to pray, to tithe, to remember the persecuted church around the world. Shifting gears a bit here, uh, Jason, you just returned from a visit to Ukraine. What did you discover there? Yeah, one of the most shocking discoveries in Ukraine is, and this is not getting a lot of coverage, is that as, as, you, as parts of Ukraine fell uh, to Putin, every evangelical church has been closed. So in the occupied oblasts, in the occupied states of Ukraine, every evangelical church has been closed, um, and um, every Catholic church. If it's not a Moscow-aligned Orthodox church, they're closed. So religious freedom is, is under threat. The Christian persecution the church is suffering right now, awful as it is, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, the greatest political leader in the history of mankind will take the world stage. He will launch a military campaign that will result in his acquiring authority over all peoples of the earth as we read in Revelation 13, 7 and 8. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. His empire will be the most extensive in all of history, encompassing the entire world, and his rule will be the most demonic the world has ever experienced. He will appear to be the savior of the world, but as he consolidates his power, his true nature will be revealed. He will emerge as a Satan-possessed, an empowered person who hates God and is determined to annihilate Christianity. His method of eliminating Christians will be by beheading as we read in Revelation 24. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. For this reason, he is identified in Scripture as the Antichrist, as we read in 1 John 2.18. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Tell us about your book, The Great Campaign Against the Great Reset. Uh, where do you see the U.S. and the world heading? The Great Reset seeks to obliterate the free institutions of civil society and the intermediary organizations between us and distant, unelected bureaucracies. I was inspired to write this book because for the past 30 years, I live and work in some of the most violent, tragic places in the world. And if you want to know how serious and how brutal this Great Reset is, it's happening. It's happening in, in Israel and Gaza. It's happening in, in, it happened in Iraq. It's happening in China. It's happened in China. It's happening in Ukraine. Behind things that are startling and strange, like you're going to eat cricket meat and love it, you're going to own no property and be happy. You need to know that the ideologues behind this are the very same globalists that are behind some of the greatest catastrophes in the past 50 years. The Antichrist will control a one world government as we read in Revelation 13, 7. It was granted to him, the Antichrist, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation, which is the world. When the deception comes, if you're not a born-again believer, you'll be swept away with it. The deception will be greater than you ever imagined in your life. It is going to be profound as to what happens. People in the high places are Satanist, they're Illuminati. Spiritual power in high places that will bring about a one world government. And by doing that, they intend to rule the world. And they have the help of a whole uh, mass of demonic spirits who are able to perform all kinds of miracles, deceptive miracles, manifestations, and all of this stuff to help them to bring about that one world government. And the goal is so that they can put one man up and worship him as God, the Antichrist.
Okay, listen to this. Iran is now supplying Russia with more than 100 of its sophisticated attack drones every single week. That's according to U.S. Central Command, giving the Kremlin a major lift in the war on Ukraine. Joining us now to talk all about it is General Keith Kellogg. General, welcome to the program. So these are pretty big drones. They're, what, 11 feet long. They're kamikaze drones. They can travel... I think a thousand miles, mm -hmm. they can do a lot of damage. But it's not the drone, it's the amount of drones that the Kremlin is now producing thanks to Iran. This is a significant issue. And in, here in America, you probably don't think much about it. But the fact is that these drones are pretty powerful drones. They carry a significant warhead, basically a 155 millimeter warhead. But the accuracy on that distance, I mean, when you look at the uh, circular area probable or how it can go, and it's GPS guided, you could launch one of those drones from Baltimore, Maryland, the airport there, put it right through the window here. Wow. That, and so, so you look at that and how the Ukrainians have taught the Russians how to fight. They call it swarm technology. So you don't see just a single, a single drone come in. You use multiple drones, 20, 30, 40, 50 in the hit. And every age has its own way of warfare. In World War One, you had the advent of the machine gun and the tank. And submarine in World War Two, you had the advent of close air support with the use of the radios and air support with the, the armor support. And now you're into drone technology. And here's the issue to me, mm -hmm. because you've really picked up on something pretty mm -hmm. large, is that we are, it's asymmetrical. We're not picking up well on it. We have got a counter drone technology. It's called the Coyote system. It's a missile system. It costs each missile is 10 times as expensive as a singular drone. So what they are doing in, a, in an asymmetric fashion, they're basically overwhelming the defense of the Ukrainians. Wow. And we have to think our way through that. And we haven't. We keep thinking of the old way of fighting, armor, artillery. They're thinking of the new way of fighting. It's not just Ukraine, though, right? I mean, these these are actually being used. The Houthis are using them as well. So mm -hmm. now Iran is, you know, yep. helping out the Russians. They're helping out the Houthis, attacking us. I think four of these targeted a U.S. Navy ship just last night in the Red Sea. What can we be doing more of? I mean, it seems like we're just allowing Iran to kind of feel like they can play a game in the marketplace. What can we be doing more of to confront them? Two things. One is you counter the technology they've got right now, and you go basically away from a missile technology to a gun technology if you have to. But you have, gonna have to, you're going to have to confront Iran sooner or later. They need to do that. They haven't done it. It's almost like whistling past the graveyard. Yeah. And, and there's ways to do it. You don't have to go to downtown Tehran to do it. You can do things to basically tell the Iranians, knock this stuff off. I mean, everything, if you want to go to the extreme, they've got a spy ship that's in the Red Sea. Well, send it to the bottom Something's if you have to do something give. like that or do something that is maybe out of the range of tehran but makes a clear point to the iranians you have got to knock this off i think you hit the nail on the head when you said do something they're becoming more frequent apparent israeli strikes on iranian and iranian linked targets in syria <laughs> the latest what are believed to be weapons depots in the northern province of aleppo a few dozen people were killed among them, Syrian military personnel and members of the Lebanese armed group Hezbollah. Israel has for years said it won't allow Iran and its allies, whose influence in Syria has grown, to entrench themselves in the country militarily. In recent months, its targeted commanders and members of Iran's Revolutionary Guards, no longer just focusing on weapons storage sites and convoys carrying arms. Among Israel's stated goals is preventing Syria being used as a transit point for weapons to reach Hezbollah and the occupied Palestinian territories. There is what has been described as a shadow war between Israel and Iran in Syria for years now. And in recent months, since Hezbollah opened a front line against Israeli forces to help Palestinians in Gaza, Israel appears to be employing the same strategy against Hezbollah. Iran's ally in Lebanon. Here in Lebanon, targeted killings by apparent Israeli drone strikes are increasing. More often than not, members of Hezbollah and at times field commanders are killed. Many here see a strategy of Israel diminishing its enemy's operational capabilities. Hezbollah, for its part, raised the costs of the conflict for Israel by forcing it to empty much of its north of many of its people. It has yet to escalate to the level of full-scale conflict, but warned it is ready if Israel expands the war. The events of uh, the last few days have been wider than what we've seen in quite some time. So I expect only further escalation. Unfortunately, we're in a regional situation where the prospects of de-escalation are, 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 are quite limited. 
And while much of the world's focus is on the war on Gaza, the violence between Israel and Hezbollah is beginning to intensify. As we continue to watch the Muslim world unite against Israel, the Bible tells us there are four possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14, the burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. Then behold, at eventide, trouble, and before the morning he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us, and the lot of those who rob us. Isaiah 17, 9, in that day his strong cities will be as a forsaken bow and an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14 tell us Damascus will be destroyed in a single night. Verse 9 suggests it is the children of Israel who caused this desolation, possibly with a nuclear weapon. Jeremiah 49, 34-37 The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam. In the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. Against Elam I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies, and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them, my fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. In this prophecy, Jeremiah predicts that Iran will be struck at the foremost place of its might, which today could infer an attack upon its nuclear program. One of Iran's most strategic and vulnerable nuclear targets is Bashar nuclear reactor located in the heart of ancient Elam. Jeremiah says that Iran has fiercely angered the Lord, and that provokes the Lord to cause a severe disaster inside of Iran. Israel seeks to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear nation. Perhaps this alludes to a nuclear disaster caused from a strike upon Iran's Boucher nuclear reactor. There's a prophecy written by Asaph the seer that many end time teachers believe has yet to find fulfillment. In this prophecy, a confederation of Muslim nations have taken crafty counsel against the Jewish people in Israel in order to destroy them as we read in Psalm 83, 1-8. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gabal, Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria also has joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. Ezekiel 38, 1-9 The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his hordes, Beth Garma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, Many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes and many peoples with you. These are the modern day nations listed in Ezekiel 38 and 39 who will be mustered in the latter years to attack Israel, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, Sudan, and Ethiopia. God tells us exactly what will happen to Iran, Russia, Turkey, and the many peoples with you when they attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, 18 through 23, and 39 to 7 and 8. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken, 
Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. I've been informed by top-ranking military officials that Israel has been unable to launch even a single plane in defense. As I stand here, fighter planes are exploding in midair. They're crashing and falling to the ground without any explanation. And while no one can seem to give me any reason for why this is happening, I can tell you this. This all-out, unprecedented attempt to destroy Israel appears to be failing. God is the one who fights this battle for Israel. He does it for two reasons. To make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel, that the nation shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Zechariah 2, 8, and 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoiled for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Israel is precious to Almighty God, the apple of his eye. He is simply saying, You touch my chosen nation Israel, you poke me in the eye. Is Vladimir Putin, the infamous Gog of Magog, that the prophet Ezekiel warned would come on the scene in the last days and lead a coalition of nations to destroy Israel? Or could Gog be Recep Tayyip Erdogan, another dictator, who is fast gaining power and dominance in the Middle East? Biblical scholars can't agree if the prophet Ezekiel was talking about a last day's assault on Israel being led by Russia or Turkey. Many popular Bible teachers claim that Gog will come from Russia, while others claim that Ezekiel's prophecy actually points to Turkey. Whether Gog is from Russia or Turkey, both nations are presently being led by undisputed dictators who could each very easily fit the Gog profile. Burnt down cars and bodies in the streets, these are some of the apocalyptic scenes in Haiti's capital. The UN denounces the gang violence which has intensified in recent weeks. The situation in Haiti is cataclysmic. Corruption, impunity and poor governance compounded by increasing levels of gang violence have eroded the rule of law and brought state institutions close to collapse. Tackling insecurity must be a top priority to protect the population and to prevent further human suffering. Over 1,500 have been killed since the start of the year and more than 360,000 Haitians displaced according to the UN, the majority of which travel to Haiti's more peaceful southern region. Those who haven't left their homes remain stuck inside for fear of getting caught in the violence. Haitians desperately wait for the transitional presidential constitution to be installed and are calling on the population to unite. The presidential council must be set up to calm the situation. If the people's demands are not met in two months' time, there will be no way out. Despite an international arms embargo put in place to try and curb the violence, the trafficking of weapons and ammunition continues through what the latest UN report calls Haiti's poorest borders. With UN rights experts saying Haiti will need between 4,000 and 5,000 international police to tackle the gang violence which has targeted institutions across the country. Is global chaos the new normal? As anyone can plainly see, the world is in a state of decay moral, economic, political, every way possible. People are saying the world is out of control and looking for someone, anyone, to rescue the planet. Soon, very soon, a leader will appear on the horizon that appears to have all the answers, to calm the oceans, to bring peace to all the nations. His title will be the Antichrist and he will be welcomed 
by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind, but his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. So yes, global chaos is the new normal. Until the Lord Jesus Christ comes at the end of the Antichrist's seven-year reign of terror and establishes true peace on earth, it seems like a good time for Satan to present the lawless one to the world. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7-12 For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep, God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.